Well, I pray that God would help us to think about today's topic well. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding uh, as to today's topic and that we would understand how to think and live in response. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the topic for today is vast, it is important, uh, it is emotional and it's sometimes even a little controversial. Uh, the topic for today is associated with some of the utter highs and the dismal lows uh, of life. And so I'm going to do my best to be biblical, uh, clear, uh, interesting, I hope, but also sensitive. The topic today is, of course, sex. So I thought I'd begin by asking, are Christians always going on about sex? What do you think? So some people sort of think, oh, yeah, Christians are so nosy. They're always going on about sex. They're butting into other people's businesses and people into people's private lives because they're worried that someone somewhere might be enjoying themselves and they want to stop it. Some people might think, no, they, they don't. They should talk about it more. It's an important issue. The Bible has stuff to say about it. We should be thinking about this topic more. It's an important one. Well, I don't know what you think, uh, but the second is actually what we're going to try and do today, uh, because sex is spoken about a fair bit in Scripture, and it, of course, it's not only uh, prominent in people's private lives today, I mean, it always has been, but it's also particularly prominent in public life in, in Western culture today. Now, I think there are some very positive aspects of the prominence of sex and sexuality in, in public life. So generally speaking, it, it's viewed... Sex is viewed very positively, generally speaking, in culture, which I think is good and which I think is biblical. And also there's some very good work done in the area of, I guess, um, research and education. Uh, many people here, I think, have probably heard the Australian Christian sexologist Patricia Wirakun speak at one time or other. And I, I found what she has to say really very helpful. So it's, it's good to have that sort of stuff available for us. But of course, uh, as we probably guess, there are some very negative aspects of contemporary views of, of sex as well. Uh, there is a, a ridicule from some of sexual uh, morality as described in the Bible. Uh, sex seems to be everywhere uh, in our culture. One Christian social commentator by the name of Carl Truman, who I've been reading a bit of recently, says sex now pervades every area of life. Everywhere one looks, the erotic sexual desire has triumphed. You know, you go to the gym, it's there on the screens. You drive down the motorway, it's there on the screen, you know, on the, on the ads for the motorway. Uh, it's all over the place. And of course, uh, and very sadly, uh, there's the great rise of pornography uh, in recent times. Uh, perhaps the internet has uh, assisted that a lot with its many associated ills. And of course, the Me Too movement has highlighted the high incidence of um, sexual harassment and assault uh, in, in Western culture. So this is the world in which we live. Uh, this is how it's changing, this is its focuses now, how should we think and live as Christians within this context? Uh, that's the aim of this morning. Now, as you would know, we're doing our Roles and Relationships series this term, and today we're looking at sex. An outline of the main points are on the handout, hopefully you've picked up on the way in and are on the screen behind me as well. So firstly, I want to think of what does society today say about sex? Secondly, what did the ancient world, you know, the, the time of the New Testament world, the Roman Empire, what do they say about sex? Thirdly, we're going to get to what does the Bible say about it, or some of the things the Bible says about it, and then finally, uh, living Christianly in what I think is a, a sex-saturated world. So, why don't we start by reflecting for, for a while on what does society say about sex? And I think society's contemporary attitudes to sex are pretty much a subset of general Western trends in thinking, and I've said many times over recent weeks in various sermons that I think Western society today is one which is dominated by ideas of autonomy, and authenticity. Do what you want to do, be who you want to be. Uh, this has seen a rise of individualism, uh, the prioritising of people's feelings, uh, a focus on expressing ourselves and the centrality uh, of sexuality. All these things are now centre stage and almost taken as givens in our culture. And in terms of uh, the sexual side of things, we want to express ourselves uh, the way we want, with whom we want, when we want, and that is seen to be a right and an essential part of our freedoms in our culture. Now, having said that there is this very, uh, I guess, wide, free-ranging view of how sex can be uh, expressed, it has to be said that society still has a number of, I guess, generally accepted restraints or constraints on it. So most people in our culture would think that mutual consent is required. But consent isn't always entirely straightforward. You know, consider the scenarios perhaps in the 
Hollywood movie industry or in politics or in um, a large company and there's a senior respected powerful member in that company industry or whatever who decides he or she wants to have sex with some junior person in that field who's trying to get on and um, they have sex it's sort of consensual but the unevenness and the power dis you know, disparity is such that some people might, might sort of think, well, that wasn't really consent. It was more, you know, force and circumstance. So consent isn't always straightforward. Uh, most people would believe that, 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 that sex between adults and, and minors is wrong, but it's sometimes a bit of a slippery slope as to, well, what's the actual age, you know? 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, where, where's, the, where's the cutoff? Most believe that sex with immediate family members is wrong. And... Um, I don't say this last one to be funny because it's referred to in the Bible, but most people believe that sex with animals is wrong. So there are boundaries in society which most people would generally agree on, even though some of them are a little bit grey. Other than that, it tends to be, well, we're free to express ourselves and, and, and have freedom. People should be able to have sex, purchase sex, view sex uh, as, as they wish to. Uh, and um, this view, and sometimes, but I emphasise not always, but it, sometimes, for some people, sex is, is reduced to being something of a bodily appetite, which needs to be fulfilled, and that's what it sort of gets down to. I'm not saying that's what most people think, but it, sometimes it gets down to that. So, um, people have freedom to choose things sexually, but that doesn't mean people are free to choose the consequences, because what we do uh, has consequences. And um, aspects of the modern attitude to sex in Western culture uh, seems to have produced multiple problems in our society. So uh, there's both anecdotal and uh, research evidence which suggests that the sleep with whom you want, when you want approach to life has not, about, not brought about the satisfaction which a lot of people had hoped for. Uh, there are scientific papers uh, you could look at about this. Uh, and so research, uh, as I understand it, has shown that having lots of sexual relationships generally doesn't make people happier. Uh, one 2013 study I, I saw summarised found a strong association between the number of sex partners someone has and later substance abuse disorder. And it's especially for women in that instance. And by contrast, a, a Scandinavian study from 2004, remember this comes out of Scandinavia, which has a certain, I guess you know, stereotypical reputation, they found that the happiness maximising number of sexual partners in the previous year, i.e. the number of sexual partners which is likely to make you the happiest, was in fact one. You know, that, that's, that's what their research indicated. Uh, anecdotally, um, I recall when I was a young man playing cricket in England as a 20-year-old, um, there was often a lot of good-natured banter in the dressing room about all sorts of issues, and there was one guy in my team who was a cockney who'd like to sort of taunt me by saying to me, Ligo, Ligo, did you get a bit of crumpet last night? Did you, Ligo? Did you get a bit of crumpet? And when he says crumpet, he's not referring to that item usually referred to, uh, prepared by bakers. And I'd sort of say, look, you know, I won't mention his name. No, and just to, to wind him up, I might sort of say, oh, no, but I had a really good prayer time with some friends from church last night. It was wonderful, you know. And then one night, I went home, he said to me, so Ligo, Ligo, you, so you're not going to have any sex until you get married, is that right? And I said that, yes, that was my, my intention. And I expected him to retort with a joke or him sort of purporting to feel sorry for me. And as I recall, he looked a bit surprised and looked somewhat wistful. And he might have even have said something like, I, did, I don't think he actually said, oh, gee, I wish I'd done that, but that was almost like the implication of what he was thinking. And I remember being quite startled by that at the time, but I guess it probably isn't surprising in the light of, you know, <laughs> the things I've just said. Another uh, contemporary problem uh, is of obviously the rise of pornography. It's very widespread, it's highly addictive, it dehumanises people and wrecks relationships. It's not a good thing to be said about it, to tell the truth. And on a larger scale, uh, the widespread consumption of pornography has been linked to human trafficking around the world. Uh, human trafficking is a modern form of slavery or enslavement. It's the fastest growing criminal industry in the world and a significant part of human trafficking is specifically sex related trafficking where people are pretty much kidnapped or, or restrained and involved in prostitution, pornography, bride trafficking 
and the commercial sexual abuse of children. Uh, recent United Nations figures have suggested that sex trafficking brings in an estimated 32 billion, yes, billion, not million, 32 billion dollars a year. And it's porn which fuels the sex trade by creating demand for all this sort of stuff. And then, as I said earlier, there are the, there's a wide incidence of, of sexual uh, assaults. Some of you may know that in 2017, an American actress tweeted. I, didn't, I had to explain what tweeting was, I think, a bit to the earlier service, but I'll assume you know what tweeting is. Uh, tweeted, um, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write me too, as a reply to this tweet. And then, as you probably know, the hashtag me too went viral by the end of the day. Um, me too had appeared 200,000 times on Twitter. Within a year, it had been used 19 million times, which is an average of 55,000 times per day. It's certainly suggesting something, isn't it? Now, uh, this is uh, some of the, the negative effects uh, in culture, and as I'm sure many of us are painfully aware of, uh, some of these negative effects have filtered into the church, and we can probably all think of examples and incidences uh, where sexual immorality has, has damaged churches and church relationships. So it seems to be that this, the sex-saturated nature of our culture doesn't seem to be producing a better world, or the world which people might have hoped for. Now, this Western attitude, in many respects, is not new. I mean, it has some unique aspects, but um, <laughs> views of sexual morality have, have been around for, the year, for years, which we may not necessarily endorse. So what are the ancients? What was the, the first century Roman Empire like in this area? Well, it has to be said that sex was very prominent in first century uh, life as well. Uh, Greek, which was the lingua franca of the day, um, there were numerous words in Greek for sexual relations, suggesting a certain preoccupation with this aspect of life. Um, there were all sorts of immoralities associated with the Greek and Roman gods, and religious uh, worship was often associated with sex. So often uh, shrines and temples would have temple prostitutes. And so I think it was the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth. It was thought may have had at one stage, you know, about a thousand temporal prostitutes. Um, homosexuality was common, and I'm not just necessarily referring to consensual examples of that, but often involved slave boys, men of lower class, who had little freedom to refuse the advances of a more powerful male. Now, you may guess that sexual practice in the first century very much favoured adults, it favoured males, and it favoured non-slaves. And so uh, the theologian and historian F.F. Bruce, who some of you may have heard of, uh, said that in pagan society, various sorts of extramarital sex were tolerated and even encouraged for men. So a man might, in addition to his wife, have a mistress for sexual and intellectual companionship. The, in the fact that there was slavery was widespread meant that it was very easy for him to have one or more concubines if he wanted to, and casual gratification could be gained from a harlot. What was the lot of the wife? In this situation, well, often the lot of the wife was to manage the household and to raise the man's legitimate children. So whereas uh, men seemed, or powerful men seemed to have an awful lot of freedom in that culture, women had significantly less freedom. The poor had less freedom and slaves had pretty much no freedom. So sometimes we might be tempted to think today when we look at Christian sexual ethics, you know, oh, gee, it must have been hard to live like this in the 21st century world. Well, I think it would have been equally hard and countercultural in a first century Roman Empire world as well. From what I can figure out, Christian sexual ethics have pretty much always been countercultural. So, point three what does the Bible say about sex? Now, a lot could be said here, I'm just going to make a few points, and probably many of them will be pretty well known and obvious, but it doesn't hurt to say them. The first thing to note is that God created sex. So in Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, it says, So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. So clearly, for men and women to be fruitful and increase in number, that involves sex, so God created sex. The point to be made here is that God is the expert on sex. He actually thought the whole idea up in the first place. It was his idea. It was his thought. He, he brought it into being. He's the expert. So it seems pretty sensible to think that, you know, well, he should know best how it should be used. I mean, it's absurd to think that we would know better than the person who even thought the whole thing up 
that we would know better than him as to how to express ourselves in this area. Second, uh, God created sex to be expressed in a male-female marriage. So the ideal is depicted in Genesis 2, as we've discussed in recent weeks, and Jesus, as I think um, Paul might have looked at last week, picks it up in Matthew 19, where he says, "'Haven't you read,' he replied, "'that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, "'and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother "'and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. "'So they are no longer two, but one.'" It's this idea of, uh, I guess, a, a holistic, total person bonding between uh, two people, this idea of oneness. Uh, there's a well-known American pastor by the name of Tim Keller who has said, sex is God's appointed way for two people to say to one another, I belong completely, permanently and exclusively to you. So sex is, is seen as part of a, an exclusive, mutually committed oneness between a husband and a wife. Thirdly, uh, God pronounces that uh, sex is very good. So at the end of Genesis chapter 1, after he's created all this this stuff, including male and female, and told us to go out and, you know, multiply, um, all that's good, so sex is very good. And then uh, that idea is unpacked further in various parts of the Bible and uh, the value of sex for companionship and pleasure as part of this whole oneness idea, is spoken of. So in Genesis 2, upon the creation of woman in this very evocative account from that chapter, you know, the man says, oh, you know, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Sounds very enthusiastic uh, and keen. And we get a further sense of of this in the book Song of Songs, which we had a bit just read to us a few moments ago. And as you would know, the book Song of Songs, evocatively, sensually and at length, I mean, for eight chapters, it's an entire book, uh, describes the love between a man and a woman. And so, you know, part of today's reading, we read that the um, man says, you know, like a lily among the thorns is my darling among the young women. And the woman says, you know, like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved a young, among the young men. And she says in verse 5, you know, strengthen me with raisins, refresh me, for I am faint with love, you know. It's compelling stuff, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it just reminds me of a typical conversation at home between myself and Shireen. <laughs> Anyway, um, (laughs) so, you know, the point here, God created sex, massively approves of it in the right context. Now, um, possibly it should come as no surprise to us that, once again, scientific studies and uh, things like this uh, have shown that married people tend to have more sex and better sex than unmarried peers. Uh, There's an article I saw from 2017 which uh, summarises a lot of the findings uh, of these reports. If you want to know, I can direct you to that article if you want me to tell you where it is sometime. Um, But, you know, married people have more and better sex. Interesting. Not the impression you might gain from general culture. So, sex uh, is good. It's it's created by God. It's good. It's in marriage. But can I say it's not essential for people to have sex. I mean, not everyone gets married or is married married. Uh, So Jesus in Matthew 19 refers to those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So some people uh, decide not to marry for whatever reason. Um, Clearly the Bible teaches they then don't have sex. Paul uh, in 1 Corinthians 7 talks about various advantages of being single, which, you know, part of the, you know, single people um, by biblical morality wouldn't have sex. So you don't need to have sex to be a total human being. Now, we're going to look at the topic of singleness uh, in in a couple of weeks' time, uh, but I guess the point is it's good, but we don't have to have it. Um, Jesus didn't, and many other fine Christian people who were married didn't. Uh, Obviously, if you're married, uh, the Bible teaches that it's good to have it, if it's possible, but you don't have to. You're not less of a person uh, if you don't. Uh, That's probably a point worth making in our current culture. (laughs) Uh, And then finally, uh, another thing worth reflecting on is that the the psychological, emotional and physical bonding of marriage points us towards the ultimate marriage. And the ultimate marriage is not between necessarily a man and a woman on earth. Uh, You probably know Ephesians chapter 5 where Paul writes, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And the next verse says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. 
So human marriage is a reflection of an even greater marriage between God and his people. And if you read Revelation uh, chapters 19 and chapter 21, we see once again Jesus' relationship with his people described in marriage terms. And so whether we're married or not on earth, whether our marriage on earth is good or leaves a lot to be desired on earth, whatever the situation is for a Christian, um, we look forward to a better marriage uh, in the future according to the teaching of Scripture, which I think is very well worth reflecting on. So, very positive picture of sex in the Bible, but also the Bible is realistic and does highlight that things can so very easily go wrong. And if you read through the pages of Scripture, you can read numerous accounts of how it's gone horribly wrong. Uh, The Ten Commandments, you know, one of the commandments is don't commit adultery. Uh, Then Jesus picks that up. Uh, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, where in chapter 5, he says, you know, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery. Uh, but I tell you, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery uh, against her in his heart. And so it's not just you know, the physical things which we can do, which are sexually immoral, but it's our thought life as well. And I think it's probably fair to say that probably everyone in this room has fallen foul of inappropriate thoughts at some stage in their life. So the Bible does acknowledge that. So, uh, fourthly, living Christianly in a sex-saturated world, worth thinking about. I guess the thing to highlight is that we need to be guided by the Bible, not by unhelpful aspects of our surrounding culture. Now, sadly, unhelpful aspects of our surrounding culture, I think, often uh, creep into the church. Um, I once uh, attended a church, and I've been to many churches, so don't worry trying to figure out which one it was. I once attended a church where a guy who was a regular was apparently sleeping with his girlfriend. Uh, And his mother, who was quite prominent in the church, apparently excused it by saying, oh, everyone's doing it these days. Uh, Now, I think, you know, when she said that, perhaps she was almost saying it's okay, you know, we approve of it, everyone's doing it now. Um... Well, if that was, if I've reflected that situation accurately, that lady was being more guided more by culture than scriptures. Um, so, you know, we want to make sure that our attitudes and our actions are being guided by scripture, not by the surrounding culture. So, being guided by the Bible, we want to know what is good and promote things which are good. So, we want to talk up marriage, talk up loving sex in marriage, talk up singleness, talk up friendships, talk up sexual morality. We want to promote good versions of all those things. Uh, one verse I've tried to apply to my life is uh, 1 Timothy 5, 2. Uh, in that verse, Timothy is writing to a, uh, sorry, Paul is writing to Timothy, who's a younger Christian leader, and he says to treat younger women as sisters with absolute purity. So men, I think that's a good verse to have in mind in our relationship um, with, with women. Um, And I think that if that's carried out well, it opens up rather than closes down relationships because you have good friendships, which you might not not otherwise have had. And then we also need to know what is bad from Scripture and oppose it. And we can oppose uh, bad things in a number of ways. Sometimes, as it said in our 1 Corinthians 6 reading, we may need to flee from sexual uh, immorality. I mean, the temptation to sexual immorality can be very strong. Uh, Powerful emotions are at play. And sometimes if you're in a high situation of temptation, perhaps it's best not to talk to the temptation or try to reason with the temptation, but to flee from the temptation, disconnect the internet, leave the party, physically run away from wherever you are. Sometimes we need to flee. Sometimes uh, we also need to fight uh, sexual immorality with God's help. So uh, someone may have an ongoing weakness in some area, whether it's, you know, um, lust or some other addictive behaviour or whatever, we can pray that God would change us. So Paul writes to Titus in Titus chapter 2 that the grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. So we should pray that God's grace would help us to change in these areas. And finally, and I think this is so, 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 so important to emphasise, if we, I mean, as is the case with all sins, if we've slipped up in this area, as we undoubtedly will in in some form or other, forgiveness is available. And it's really important to grasp that. Um, You know, sometimes people look back on things which they've done or which have happened to them in terms of sexual immorality and they, they find it very hard to deal with it. But the truth of the matter is that if we're Christians, if we confess it, God will forgive us. You know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 
And I'm sure that in pretty well every congregation I speak to today, this will be very true for some people. And the Bible teaches in this area as well as every other area of life, that no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, Jesus' death is big enough to cover that sin. <laughs> yeah, so whatever it is, uh, and I, I, I know some people have, you know, that find it very hard to think that they could be forgiven for some things perhaps that they've done, um, but you, 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 one can be. Let me conclude. Uh, a Christian man I know from another church, um, a number of years ago, dated a girl from that church, and they were both uh, Christians, as I understand it, and they both assumed they would eventually get married. But they didn't. But they thought they were. And so they decided they'd start sleeping together. Anyway, when they eventually broke up, they broke up, they eventually went off to marry different people. And um, these days, uh, the man in question is a very keen Christian. He's very happily married to someone else and has a family and is, is involved in his church and doing really good stuff. But he said to me once that he really looks back with regret on what he did when he was younger. But I didn't specifically ask him that. I think he would be quite comfortable with the fact that he's been forgiven for it and he's getting on with following Jesus. I guess the point to make here is that we can be forgiven for mistakes in the past. I mean, they will relieve regret. You know, it does leave its mark, but we can be forgiven for it. Um, so I think that's a helpful story. It's sometimes been said that sex is like a fire you know, wonderful in its place, like a fireplace, but horribly damaging if it cuts loose. So let's keep it in its right place. God is the inventor of sex. He knows how best it's to be experienced, which is lovingly and in the mutual commitment of a marriage. Uh, let me pray for us. Uh, Heavenly Father, um, the things we've said are perhaps maybe are new to some people here, uh, but maybe are very familiar to many people here. Lord, we do pray that you would give us a biblical mind about all aspects of um, sexual morality, that it's a good thing, but we need to, it needs to be properly handled and dealt with. Uh, Lord, help us to believe the right stuff and give us the strength to live out the right stuff. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.